So I'm going to call this segment narcissism and insecure attachment styles. I just want to qualify. I'm talking about narcissism as a presentation, as a collection of symptomatic uh, presentation. I'm not talking specifically about the criteria for narcissistic personality disorder. I am talking about people who present on a narcissistic spectrum of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. I usually don't talk a lot about narcissism. That is because there's so much out there and there it's become kind of like a mental health diagnosis that somehow it's socially okay to stigmatize people with this. And it can lead to a lot of witch hunting. It devolves very quickly. That said, I do want to explain how and why these things overlap. And I see a lot of people making assumptions about attachment styles and, and specifically narcissistic presentation. And I think it's important to mm, touch upon it. Now with the knowledge and understanding that we're going to explore in this particular segment, we're going to talk about the four subtypes of narcissistic presentation and how that can impact your life and relationship. And you'll also have a better understanding of how narcissistic wounding can be filtered through insecure attachment styles. You probably want to grab a piece of paper and a pencil because you'll want to take notes on this um, and make sure you stick with me until the end of the segment. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Brianna McWilliam and I am a licensed and board certified creative arts therapist, author, and educator with more than 15 years in the field, helping adults struggling with insecure attachment go from self-doubting to self-sovereign so they can attract those soul-shaking, passionate partnerships that they want without having to talk in circles around their feelings for hours or even years on end with no tangible result. And I do this using a psycho-spiritual approach to creative arts interventions using the McWilliam Method. Today, I'm gonna to be sharing a clip of a live stream event that took place inside my private Facebook groups, which people can access once they've purchased one of my online courses. If you're interested in finding out if you might have insecure attachment, check out the link in the caption of this video. You'll be able to take an easy four question quiz and find out your attachment style, plus a detailed explanation. Now, if you like what you see in here and you haven't yet, make sure that you like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications. I put up videos once or twice a week, and sometimes I will do occasional live streams through my YouTube channel, and I wouldn't want you to miss out. So in the literature, here are four subtypes that might emerge. So the first is we have the pro-social or communal narcissist, and the tagline for this subtype would be, look at all the great things that I've done for the world, right? So Eleanor Greenberg, who is a psychologist and she's a lecturer um, on narcissistic disorders, she coined the term the white knight narcissist to describe pro-social narcissists. So these are people that like to do good things for other people and to make them happy. And they often do it in a very public way so that other people will see them doing good things and then give them the validation that they are seeking for it. So if you have a more pro-social narcissist in your life, you may recognize them by how much fun they are to be around. Um, they want to be liked and appreciated by everyone. They use their empathy or their, their sort of, let's say, this might be more diffuse empathy, right? Or fix it empathy. They may use that to understand what pleases people so that they can experience that deep sense of satisfaction in your response to them right? Which makes them feel validated, which makes them feel seen because internally they don't really have a sense of self, right? They need your mirrored response to know that they exist. Okay. I'd say that's probably true of all narcissists actually. Then we have antisocial narcissist and the tagline for this one is I'm better than you. So you owe me, right? So people with antisocial narcissism, they're usually very difficult to deal with. Um, they have a very self-centered, a uh, way of being. They expect a lot from the people in their lives, kind of entitled. Um, they are often arrogant and they will do whatever it takes to get what they want. They're also less likely to have long-term relationships. They don't feel limited by the truth, but when they are caught in a lie, they get very angry. They view the social landscape as kind of a competition and they will do anything to win it. It's also worth noting that antisocial narcissistic presentation folks that have this are more likely to demonstrate recklessness and impulsivity. They also don't require the same degree of admiration and they don't necessarily envy other people to the same extent that other narcissists do. Okay. 
Then we have the malignant narcissist. And this is the one that most people think of when you say the word narcissist. And the tagline here is, I don't care what it takes. I get what I want. And the ends justifies the means, right? So malignant narcissists can have long-term uh, relationships, but their behavior is unstable. These individuals tend to be more attention seeking and they do care a lot about what other people think, pe other people think, even if they say they don't. They have a strong need to protect their inflated self image and they can get upset very easily if someone says something that they don't like or perceive it as criticism. They often misuse or exploit relationships for their own benefit and they will gaslight you to make you doubt your own feelings and intuitions. They are also more likely to be strategically manipulative. They can become angry and aggressive if they feel like they are being threatened, but this is in a much more calculated and strategic way as opposed to the impulsive and reckless way, okay? Of note, this category of narcissists, they have a tendency to be more like psychopaths than any other type, but they will still feel some guilt or shame when lying or breaking rules, whereas a psychopath feels no guilt or shame, okay? Then we have the vulnerable or the covert narcissist. And the tagline here is, I'm special, but nobody recognizes it, okay? So the vulnerable or the covert narcissist also believes that they are superior deep down, but they keep those beliefs hidden inside. They're very self-absorbed and they feel that they deserve a lot more attention than they get. And this makes them feel like victims who have, have not been recognized for their brilliance or their specialness. So there's a tremendous need to, for their specialness to be proven, whether that is in the positive or the negative. So these narcissists can be highly sensitive, but their sensitivity doesn't necessarily extend to the feelings of other people. They're very likely to feel depressed, um, even as they express powerful contempt for other people. Generally speaking, um, they have little emotional maturity while still paradoxically being very emotionally perceptive. They have no concept of self and in many cases, a flimsy moral compass. So they don't know how to relate to the autonomous selves of other people, okay? They don't, they're not really capable of that kind of vicarious empathy that we spoke of. So even if they present themselves, for example, even if they present themselves as spiritually elevated, it's usually only through some kind of strategic intellectual performance that is actually quite vacant at the root of it. And that can translate into a lack of empathy, manipulative, passive aggression as a form of manipulative behavior, uh, bullying behaviors. And that is whether it is, actually that is whether it is covert or overt. Okay. Let me know if this is landing with you. Give me a comment there. Let me know how, how you're digesting this, if it's making sense, um, if more questions are coming up. I'd love to know if you are connecting with this information at all. Right. So I wanna just, bring all this in and talk about it through the filter now of attachment styles. So let's look at narcissism and attachment styles. Now, any of these subtypes of narcissistic presentation could show up in any of the three insecure attachment styles, including anxious, avoidant, or disorganized. Okay. So briefly, and most of you know this, but briefly, remember, attachment styles are an in instinctual blueprint in the survival part of our brain and nervous system that determines how much closeness or distance we need in a relationship to feel comfortable, to feel like our survival needs are met. Now, in order to achieve that optimal proximity in love, um, according to an insecure attachment style, you are likely to display either an excessive anxious clinging or reaching for behavior or an excessively avoidant pulling away and withdrawing behavior, or sometimes a combination of both to the point where you freeze. So for example, a people-pleasing pro-social narcissist could be more avoidant by crafting a very carefully cultivated persona that advocates for others while at the same time keeping close intimate relationships at a distance, right? And that's because it's a lot easier to bond to a cause or to a group of people than it is to experience intimacy on the level of one other person, right? Or even two other people. Now, on the other hand, we could see a lot of pro-social narcissists demonstrating people-pleasing behaviors with a more anxious disposition. And these folks would cling to the people that they are advocating for in search of a sense of validation, stability, and even personal identity, okay? Now, similarly, 
an individual with avoidant attachment could use the victimized identity of the vulnerable covert narcissist to justify their avoidant behavior, right? You'll just leave me in the end and blame me for your disappointment. Better to avoid it altogether, right? Or uh, equally, an anxious, vulnerable, covert narcissist could use victimization to justify their clinging behaviors. Look at how much you hurt me. If you really loved me, you would step up and be what I need, right? So you get the idea. But when it comes to the healing and recovery, the most important thing is to recognize these narcissistic wounds are really the result of attachment wounding and in essence are what we call self wounds, which means cultivating a stronger, more authentic and confident sense of self is required to get past it. And that's why I like to use the word self sovereignty. That's why, you know, all the things we do together in our courses is about cultivating that sense of self and awareness and self sovereignty so that we can move beyond this kind of wounding. So this includes sifting and sorting through the emotional chaos that you are left with, which you know, is further further uh, exacerbated by a hypervigilant nervous system that is super sensitive to attachment threats and triggers, especially if you have been in a narcissistic abusive situation, right? And you're struggling with your own narcissistic wounding. So recovering from narcissism or from narcissistic abuse requires, I believe, two really important things. And that is number one, building a robust uh, emotional vocabulary. And for anyone that's taken my Attachment 101 courses, you know that's like the first or second lesson that we do. And then second, establishing firm but flexible boundaries so that you can experience a more realistic and secure sense of personal agency and identity. So why does any of this matter? Well, the type of narcissism you are dealing with will have an impact on the way your partner interacts with you and how you might interpret their attitude towards you. Do they display malignant or vulnerable behavior? Or do they seem to be more pro-social or anti-social? Knowing these distinctions can help you know best how to respond to them when they are displaying abusive or toxic behavior. And if someone is using their own narcissistic wounds as justification for implementing insecure attachment behaviors, understanding what's driving that might make it easier to confront those emotional scars without taking it so personally or taking on too much responsibility for it. Now, I hope you found this information helpful in understanding the intersections between narcissistic wounding and insecure attachment styles. If you did, make sure you leave me a comment and let me know. In the second part of this video series, I'm gonna explore this more in depth, the process of recovery and healing, and also introduce an art therapy activity to help you cultivate stronger personal boundaries and a sense of self-security. So make sure that you like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications because you do not want to miss the next two parts of this series. Thank you and have a great week.